Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Current Voices Uprising Plus Five with Joe Giordano and Devin Allen, presented in partnership by the Jewish Museum of Maryland and the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture. I'm Jackie Copeland, Executive Director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. Thank you all for attending this digital online program. I want to thank the staffs of the Jewish Museum and the Lewis Museum for pivoting from an in-person program at a museum to this online program. A special thank you to the Open Society Institute Baltimore for helping to make this program and exhibit possible. So a few housekeeping notes before we start. I ask for your patience with any technical glitches that might occur. If you have any technical challenges during the talk, please use the chat function, uh, the chat uh, button at the bottom of the screen and someone from the programs team will attempt to assist you. In the museum, this would also be the point where I would say to you, please silence your cell phones. So yes, you can silence your cell phones, but more importantly, tonight we ask that you keep your microphones muted and submit your questions via the chat feature for our panelists to answer at the end of the talk. For those of you who are new to Zoom, we recommend that you select the speaker view option. Uh, that is on the upper right hand of your computer screen. Choose the speaker view option rather than the Brady Bunch style grid you may be seeing at present. To do this, please look at the top right corner of the window and select speaker view. Finally, when the pre presentation ends or if you need to leave early, simply hit the leave button at the bottom of your screen to exit. Now I'd like to introduce the moderator of the panel, Tracy Guy Decker. Tracy is the deputy director of the Jewish Museum of Maryland. She serves as chair of the Social Justice Committee at Baltimore Hebrew, Hebrew Congregation and co-chair of the Leadership Council of Jews United for Justice Baltimore. Prior to joining the Jewish Museum of Maryland, Guy Decker led marketing departments at Johns Hopkins University and the United Jewish Federation of Tidewater in Virginia Beach, Virginia. She has a BA in English from Oberlin College and an MA in Religious Studies with a concentration on the history of Judaism from the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. Tracy? Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, I am Tracy uh, uh, from the Jewish Museum of Maryland. Um, one of two Tracys, actually. <laughs> and first, I want to thank uh, Demika Baker, Alyssa Foley, and of course, Jackie um, from the Lewis Museum. I am very grateful for your partnership. Uh, thanks, too, to my colleagues, Trillian Atwood and Laura Grant, who are working the technology behind the scenes right now. A big thank you, as Jackie said, to the Open Society Institute Baltimore for their support of this project. We are about to talk to two talented photographers, both Baltimoreans. Devin Allen was born and raised in West Baltimore. Allen gained national attention when his documentary photo photograph of the Baltimore up Uprising was published on a Time magazine cover in May 2015. Only the third time the work of an amateur photographer has been showcased there. Allen has turned his attention toward arming the youth of Baltimore with cameras, not guns. The mission of his Through Their Eyes project is to spread hope and love through art by training students from districts where arts education programs have been underfunded on how to use photography to express themselves. Through crowdsourced fundraising, Allen provided students with cameras, donated his time holding youth photography workshops, and organized an exhibition of the students' work. Alan is dedicated to empowering young people to tell their stories, and the fellowship, uh, I'm sorry, and, and he will continue doing that through, the, through their eyes project. J.M. Giordano, Joe Giordano, is an award-winning photojournalist based here in Baltimore. He's co-host of the photojournalism podcast, 10 Frames Per Second. His work has been featured in GQ, D23, 
The Observer, New Review Sunday Magazine, The Guardian, The Telegraph, Washington Post, Baltimore City Paper, ID Magazine, Discovery Channel, Rolling St and Rolling Stone. His work from the Struggle series is in the permanent collections at the Reginald Lewis Museum. And in 2015, he was shortlisted for the National Gallery's Outwin Buchever Portrait Prize. I probably said that wrong, I apologize. Like so many Baltimoreans, um, the Baltimore uprising is a touchstone of my own journey uh, in anti-racism. And it so happens that I started at the JMM on April 20th of 2015. And so the Baltimore uprising is also connected in my mind with my time at the museum. I was deeply moved by the presentation of large scale versions of Devon's uprising images at the Lewis a few years ago, and equally touched by Joe's photos in the exhibit Shuttered at the BMI, um, the Baltimore Museum of Industry much more recently. I'm disappointed that we are not celebrating these two talented men and remembering the uprising and its lasting images in person at the museum. But I am deeply grateful to everyone for this chance to be a part of this now virtual experience. And with that, I wanna to turn to Devin and to Joe with a question. I wanna start with what may be the obvious question, which is <laughs> how do you guys know one another? When did you meet? Uh, you wanna kick that off, Joe? I'm gonna go first. Yeah, well, uh, um, I was the photo editor at Baltimore City Paper. And while I was shooting, uh, taking photos during the uprising and the Time Magazine had just come out and I, I had to meet this, this cover star on <laughs> for the city paper. Um, so we, 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 uh, we got to hang out and I brought my copy of the uh, time magazine with me to get signed. Cause I wasn't sure I'd ever talk to him again. So I had to make <laughs> sure I had this signed. Now I have, a, I have a collection of um, what I call iconic uh, magazines. I have Gordon Parks's first issue in life magazines. And I got Devin's time magazine right next to the, Gordon Parks, um, first issue of Life Magazine. That's pretty good. Yeah, so, yeah, so when I met Joe, um, I was still an amateur photographer, but um, we became really good friends. And uh, a lot of people don't know that when the uprising happened, they thought it was just like a week or a weekend. It was just, you know, in April, you know, but for us, and I know Joe can uh, agree with this, that we was out for the rest of the year. So me and him built the relationship because we would start seeing each other at marches. And then when I would start to dive back in my archive and I would find all these images of Joe in all my damn pictures. <laughs> He's like in every single shot that, all, everywhere I was at before I knew Joe, he was there. And even now to this day, I'm diving through my archive, you know, because it's the five year anniversary. And it's like, I'm finding new pictures that I like now. And I'm like, there go Joe, there go Joe, and there go Joe. And then from there, I just became a fan of the work. And I just respect how um, he's one of my favorite photographers. I love how he connects to the community and how he goes about his uh, path to journalism. And I became a fan after that. And we've been friends ever since. Yeah, I, when I told my grandmother I wanted to be in Time Magazine, I didn't really think it would be in someone else's photographs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about that time. Um, can you maybe let's... Um, Joe, let's start with you just because you're on my screen right now. Um, tell me a little bit about your experience uh, of the uprising. Well, if you, um, if any of the people tuning in, if you, when you get off here, if you want to read the uh, fantastic essay by Evan Serpic that accompanies this exhibition, he was the uh, editor at the city paper at the time. And he knows this kind of went back to all the way to 2014. So it really didn't start. In, in Baltimore, you know, it, it started with Mike Brown. It started, uh, you know, Trayvon Martin. It started earlier than, than just here. So we, we had been covering protests throughout those couple of years before the uprising had happened. Um, and then, um, you know, there was one, you know, when, when, when Freddie Gray, the, the first, he, he, he passed away on the 19th. And I think that the first, the first real protest here was the 20th of just a handful of people at city hall. And it, it kind of snowballed and escalated from there. And we were a staff of maybe a dozen working, you know, almost 24 hour shifts for um, almost a month, like three weeks working on, on this. Um, and then Devin was, I mean, right up at the front line, uh, you know, with his camera throughout the, from the beginning on, he was shooting before that, but like he said, but he was doing from 
the beginning all the way through and then beyond that because you know our goal you know this is this is a city we live in so we didn't we didn't parachute in here from another city you know to take photographs and parachute out we we mm -hmm. stayed and we covered the events after mm -hmm. um one of the series i did i'm going to post on instagram uh probably tomorrow is i went to the churches in over in um gilmore and west baltimore when the uprising when the uh curfew was lifted because I wanted to see happy, you know, I wanted to see people rejoicing. I want to see happy people. It, you know, it's not, there's this thing in the media and it goes all the way up to the highest levels, like the awards is that people in pain are what win awards and you know, what people want to see, <coughs> you know, we live here. So we, we went to like, you know, basketball courts and got pictures of people, you know, older guys helping young kids and like during the uprising. So that Sunday I wanted to do something really, kind of relaxing and show the neighborhood after all this trauma had happened, the churches were still open. So I was invited in. Um, I was invited into one of the churches over off of uh, Landvale. And it was funny because I, I usually have my, I usually have my hat on and my, my green, my combat jacket. And uh, I had, I wore a suit and tie for the, for the um, church. And on my way over, people who I knew were yelling at me calling, saying CNN, go home. <laughs> yeah, I see it. It's like, oh, Joe, yeah, what's up, man? Yeah, city paper, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I had to put the suit on because my yeah, grandma. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I went into a house of worship in anything less than a suit, so I, I had to put my suit on to go and take pictures in in the churches. Yeah, yeah. Um, on, on my side, you know, when uh everything happened, like I was outside, I never forget. And like I like what Joe said, the uprising started way before because my first time ever documenting, like my first protest geared to this type of situation was Mike Brown in Baltimore. But a lot of people don't know that in Baltimore, we were, we were marching for Mike Brown. And that was one of the first protests that I documented, you know, and um, and that's when I really started understanding my own power with my photography. So when Freddie Gray happened, I was actually outside and I got the video like in a text message because the video was going around the city. So they was like sending it to like people. And like Joe said, we not just parachuting in here we're from Baltimore and Baltimore is small. And um, things with me and Freddie Gray, me and Freddie Gray had mutual friends. So I know people that knew Freddie because I have friends from Gilmore Homes. And my friend Kiana, who I went to high school with, is actually one of the voice you can hear in the background saying that her leg is broke. And me and Kiana went to Falls Park High School together. So I jumped on the ground immediately because I understand, I understand how my city is kind of set up. And like Joe said, everything was peaceful and pretty small until like that that Saturday after Freddie Gray, um, after he died was that Saturday before, I think, uh, the funeral. And I just went out and just started documenting. And similar to Joe, it was it was really big on, because the way I think media moves so fast, I wanted to make sure I can tell this, follow the story all the way through. And um, just similar to Joe, I wasn't just looking for, you know, that CVS, you know, everybody was in front of the CVS for hours on end where you had people around the corner that were doing prayer circles or, you know, you had these, these town hall meetings or you had the kids dancing at the park and documenting that all the way through. So the uprising, I felt like it was different levels and layers to it. And um, most people was there for the peak of it, which was, you know, everything that happened at Madame and Mall and everything else. But when it started, when we started to take back our community and the community started to settle, a lot of people kind of parachuted right back out and pulled out, you know, but, I can say like like Joe, it was one of those things that we felt like we was in it all year, regardless if you, once you was like casting into it, it was like, regardless of how much, how we all had different views on what we wanted, but we all, it was like a big uprising family because we all got so close. We were all at protests together, meetings and doing interviews. And we became, the network was just, was was, was different. The lay, the lay of the land was really close that whole year. Everybody was really on the ground that whole year. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I'm going to actually pivot us to the um, to the exhibit, uh, the gray and black and white. So um, mm -hmm. for those who don't know yet, uh, these are Joe's photos that Devin curated. So Devin, uh, I want to ask you um, in curating and selecting the images, what were you hoping to have the audience take away um, from the experience of viewing right. these photos? Yeah, so I, I'm not actually a curator, but I'm a big fan of curating. And 
what draws me to artists that I love um, from all different mediums is when I feel like I can connect to the source. When I feel like I can look at your work and I feel connected to you and I feel like I know you, if I actually know you or not, and that's what I look at the, the, the personality coming through the work. And with Joe's work, when he asked me to do it, I, I knew some of the photos I was always going to pick, but I always I know Joe and I know photographers really well that he has a bunch of work that people probably never seen that's really good. So I was super excited about it. But but the thing is with Joe, Joe is probably one of my favorite journalists. Not because I know him, it's because I know what it, because I can look at his work and I can tell from the scope of the lens and his moral compass. And I can see that I've seen so much work from the uprising, of course, but it's only certain photographers that was actually captured a moment. You can tell they're not just shooting with just their eyes or looking or chasing the story or looking for a big break. You could tell that Joe was shooting from his heart. You could tell that Joe was in it to win it. He was in it to tell the truth. He was in it to, you know, lock in that history so that the story won't get misconstrued. So when I start pulling through his work, I wanted people to understand how close Joe was, mm -hmm. how Joe can pair, you know, and put his life on the line. Because Joe get closer than me, and I'm black. So, you know, I ain't going to get so close. But... You know, I still get really, really close, but Joe is in the mix and he does this thing where he's able to capture the emotion really well. So he pairs these, and, he, and it, he's a well-seasoned photographer. A lot of people don't know. And people will see a blurred image from Joe and think, oh, that's not a good photo. But it's like Joe knows his sentence. He knows all his stuff. This is all just because he's that good. So he captures the moment. He's about catching the essence. So when I pulled the work, I wanted people to see how close Joe was and how close he is, not just physically, but how close he is to the work. What's your Venmo, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a Venmo, but I got a cash app. Cash app, yeah. I was going to say, what's your cash yeah. app? It's the same thing as my Instagram name. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, what, um, all the photos in this exhibit, you left untitled. Every single one is untitled. Can you um, talk to us about that decision? Yeah, I mean, they're not, the, the, the untitled thing can go either way. Some people think it's pretentious. Some people think there shouldn't be any titles. And I was there to document what was happening in the community, what was happening in the city. It's not for me to interpret what's going on in the picture, mm -hmm. especially being a white dude as a guest in those neighborhoods. It's, it's not... I don't have, it's not for me to say what's going on in those pictures. So I want people to look at them from wherever they're from and, and they can glean for themselves what's going on in those pictures. Um, because like I, I tell students, you know, when, when you're a journalist or you're a photojournalist and a, and a lot of us, I mean, me and the media, a lot of us don't adhere to this, but these neighborhoods you go in, you're a guest there like someone's house and you act like you're in someone's house. And if they say, don't take any pictures, then don't take any pictures. You don't have the, the right to be there. So when I untitle these photos, I want people to, I don't want to be the interpreter for them. Because one, they're not, I'm not going to give them an artistic title, right? Mm -hmm. So that's out. So, and I don't know what the motivations are behind people a lot that I photograph, you know? So I want to, you have to be careful with how you phrase things and what you do. And that's why I keep them untitled. So people can just look at the picture and they don't, they can come to their own interpretations. Well, let's look at a picture actually. Jillian, can you put up the one um, that we talked about? Uh, my colleague Jillian is gonna screen share right now. And what we're gonna be looking at is actually when we asked Devin, what was the first or the most important image in this series? Um, this is the one that he that he identified. Devin, why is that? So when you look at a lot of images from the uprising, a lot of people came in and they only was looking for pain on top of more pain. Um, or they just was looking at it as just a regular protest. But it was way more deeper than that to us. Definitely people that were from here. So you have few photographers and journalists that was coming to Baltimore and digging as deep as Joe was. And in my community, we call that 10 toes down. So Joe was 10 toes down. <laughs> and I respect the, 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 the calmness of this photo. And you can tell that he's welcome into the house. You can see everything that's going on outside. And you know why he's there. 
But this to for me, and then the playoff just Joe. I love the fact that Joe always it reiterates that he's a white photographer and he's a guest in this house, and he does it justice. It's only few photographers that's not from my community that can come in, have respect for the lay of the land, understand it, but then apply it to the art form. So when I saw this image, it just spoke to me because there's a person that was on the ground too. This is just an iconic image. It's, it's showing you from a different side of the fence, you know, because as a kid, it's been times growing up in West Baltimore that I can't go outside. I can't, you know, get into certain things. So just being a, just understanding from being a youth from West Baltimore and then putting myself in those kids' shoes, just like looking out the window and seeing and not knowing, you know, in your own community, you know, and you got to think about it. That's in Gilmore Homes. You can see Gilmore Homes right there where Freddie Gray is from. So it was just an iconic, iconic image. It's probably one of my favorites from Joe. And I'm mad that I didn't see it until it was time to go do this and curate this. And, and Joe, I understand you were actually surprised that this was um, one of the ones that Devin selected. Is that, yeah, is that right? People, yeah, I mean, I was surprised because um, most people that see this series, you know, they, they, they're only looking at this, this picture. Is, nobody remembers this picture. Like, this is the first time anyone's actually pointed this picture out. It's probably, if not my favorite, in my top three favorites. Because the story behind it was that you know, I saw, I, you know, we were, and this was, this was the first March. This was on Saturday. So this, this was just the March. And during the March, you know, I, I was looking around, I'm like, well, what are the people in these windows seeing, like looking down on this? And I, I again, like Devin said, I wasn't there just to get the, the cool shot right in front of the March, like a lot of other people. So I just yelled up, this woman was at the window and I yelled up, I'm like, Hey, I'm with city paper. Can I come up and take a picture from, your window down and she's like yeah sure come up so uh I, ca I came upstairs and i took my hat off thanks to my grandmother i take my hat off when i go into someone's apartment <laughs> i was in this lady was like come on in don't even worry like I, so these are her grandchildren that were watching down from the window so i just said can i take a step back she didn't want their faces in i said no problem so i just i got their silhouette and i and i asked her i said you know how come they're not how come you guys are up here? She's like, they got homework to do. They ain't going down there in that mess. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a grandma. Uh, you know, and, you know they're, 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 raised, they're, they're being raised with a grandma. So, but it's also the future kind of looking down on the present, mm -hmm. you know, like, like these, these, these kids are, you know, are what's coming. I took a similar photo um, at the woman's March of two young girls in the pink hats watching the, just from the back, just the two heads. They were sisters. They had, they were just leaning on each other watching this whole parade of adults go by. So that was kind of like the future. And I think this, that picture was taken because it reminded me of, of this one. And these kids looking, you know, kind of going, look, looking down on watching all the events of the future or the, or the present. And this is kind of the future watching. So, but I was surprised because no one ever picks up on this picture because of the other stuff in the, in the particular series of the windows breaking and whatever, yeah. This one's a more contemplative one, and it's just kind of glossed over. Yeah, I think it's going to age really well, though, Joe, when you really think about it. I think when I dive into, like, a Gordon Puff or, like, I'm, I just finished going through Robert Houston's work, I think these subtle moments really speak to the time that I think a lot of people overlook because, you know, if it bleeds, it leaves. So I think a lot of people look at our imagery, and they see the aggressive because a lot of my images that I love, my police cars of the smashing or things being thrown on it gets way more, you know, traction. But I think images like this actually age really well. It's going to be way more powerful, you know, um, definitely with the context behind it later on. I have a lot of questions. Um, and <laughs> I want to make sure that our audience um, has time. So I'm going to ask um, one more. And I want to let everyone know who's, who's listening. There will be a chance for you to ask. In fact, um, if you want to start sort of putting questions in the chat, um, my colleagues are going to help me kind of um, moderate those. Um, so I guess what I want to ask is it's, it's been five years and some things have changed and have too it. many things have not. Too many things have not. Um, you guys are both, you've said it repeatedly that you're both, you're here, you're, you're in Baltimore. Um, you are, uh, 
you're, you're not parachuting in. You both use that phrase. So with that in mind, who is doing work that you are excited about in the city now? Like photo work? Any kind of work, whether it's, you know, activism work, trying to address the root causes of the uprising in the first place. If it, is it art? Is it a combination? Like what Devin's doing um, with the Through Their Eyes? Like where are the groups where you see kind of hope and change that are doing work on the ground right now? I mean, I mean, D, D Watkins, Kondwali, like, the, you know, hit. D Kondwali and Devin are like these three musketeers that are going to be like, <laughs> 15 years. It's going to be called something like the Baltimore school or the East West Baltimore, something like that, but it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. Um, Shan Wallace is, I mean, she's doing some fantastic work. Um, so, I mean, Dev, who, who, who do you think? Um, I think, I think what, I, what it's been five years. And then like, like you said, a lot hasn't changed, but what I see like for me, I, you know, it's sad it happened to Freddie, but what I can see where I come from, people are way more empowered, with, though I think that a lot of people are starting to, like, all right, if I have a voice, you know, I feel like a lot of people, even including myself, before Freddie Gray, I felt like I ain't had no voice, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't make no change, I couldn't inspire anybody, but then post-Freddie Gray dying, and now I understand my position and the fact that my career is built on the broken back of Freddie Gray. I have power now. I feel like I can inspire the youth and do so many things. So when I look like people are doing good work or at least trying, I see way more people from where I'm from who felt hopeless or just didn't feel like things didn't, uh, didn't apply to them or just putting their good foot forward, trying to make change. Um, if you look at people like Erica Bridgefoot, well, I know it's Miss Thomas. Baltimore ceasefire that she was my kindergarten teacher, you know, um, <laughs> she's my kindergarten teacher. You know, I've been on panels with her and everything else. Um, I still see people from like Meg and all the homies from the people that's, that been on the ground. And that's the thing. This is like some seasoned activists in Baltimore that has been on the ground since before Freddie Gray. So applause to all them. And you talking about the, the Tawandas and, uh, you know, the shorties and, and the Megs and, Everybody else, um, it's so much more. To, it's so many people we can name. You said Kondwani, D. Watkins. Even in the in the in the in the art scene, you have people that are just, you know, making art that allows them to control the narrative now. And um, Joe is doing some amazing work. You got people like Joshua Harris that's doing amazing work. Um, you got people like Chris Wilson, Jeffrey Kent. Then you have all these other artists that are being born in the city and taking those narratives back. There's so many people I can name. I'm trying to think of so many people, but it's just so many people going on. We have so many amazing Baltimore uh, teachers that, you know, are doing work in the school system that a lot of people don't know. I'm always at schools now, you know, so shout out to everybody. All of the real thugged out teachers that's, you know, sticking it with our youth. Um, it's so many people who I can name right now. But what I can say for what I've seen is people are taking more accountability for their own communities. It's like, all right, well, if I'm working in the restaurant business, I'm going to do this. If I'm working in the brewery business, I'm going to do this to try to amplify this. I see a lot of local businesses getting behind the community where they never have before. I see, um, I just see people trying to make, that have learned from the uprising and trying to move forward and then just be accountable and making sure they use whatever resources they have to give back to the community. And I encourage everybody just to do the same thing. That's just what me and Joe do. We picked up the camera. We, we we use photography to engage and to do what we have to do to help move the community forward. And I encourage everybody only takes like a little small thing to make some change. And that's what I'm seeing from my community on my end. So let's talk about your photography, both of you. Um, so um, I want to remind people that we're, we are joined together to talk about this um, virtual exhibit of Joe's work, which is available at grayinblackandwhite.com, which someone will put in the chat for me. Um, where else can folks go to see uh, Devin, your work, and Joe, your work? Go ahead, man. Oh, me? I'm going to go first. Uh, so uh, my work right now, I have, uh, all my work is on my Instagram. Um, People found out about me. Um, I got on a time cover by using social media. So I don't have a website. I like to do everything um, on Instagram. It's very personal for me. I put all my work on social media. 
Um, I have work um, in the Reginald Ralph Lewis Museum in their permanent collection. I have work in the Smithsonian, the Studio Museum of Harlem. Right now, I don't have any shows up, of course, um, how things are set up right now, but I do have a virtual online exhibition with City Hall that, they, that just opened up today. What about Gordon Parks Foundation? Oh, yeah, I have um, some images in the permanent, uh, <laughs> the permanent uh, collection of the Gordon Parks Foundation, too, and um, we plan to do, well, depending on how this works out, we had small talks about doing another show soon. So and the book? Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll be your hype, man. Look, I'll be your hype. I don't think you need to Venmo him anymore. <laughs> I think you guys are even right, now. Yeah, yeah. So now we're even now. Um, also, my book, uh, my book is uh, called A Beautiful Ghetto. And it looks at um, everyday life in West Baltimore and uh, some places in East Baltimore, mainly West. And it um, has uh, work from um, my from my work from the Baltimore Uprising. And it has a foreword by D. Watkins, Kianga Hamete, who wrote Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. We have Westmore. Um, Aaron Bryant, curator from D.C., and um, a amazing poem from Tart, who's also from West Baltimore. That's all I got, Joe. <laughs> and that's, a, that's a Haymarket Books. You can get that on Amazon. Buy it. Buy from ha no, you can actually go to Haymarket Books. You can get it from Haymarket? Dollars. Okay, yeah. Okay, get it from Haymarket. Get off. Yeah, or, or Atomic Books in Baltimore. Any of the books are yep. in Baltimore. Yeah, um, Atomic Books, Greedy Reads. Um, I'm forgetting somebody. Yeah, I think... Ivy Red, book. I'm the Ivy and um, Red Emmas. Red Emmas. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 So Shout out to all my local bookstores. We love and, you. you. And miss you. many of them are still selling online. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Joe, tell us about where we can see your work. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm working on a, a few series now. They're mostly on Instagram. I mean, my, my, a lot of my city paperwork is on my website, um, jmgiordanophotography.com. But like Devin, I'm starting to, pivot away from that because I, I get hit up on Instagram, you know, and chat more than someone going to my website. Um, uh, I'm working on some projects I don't really want to get into right now, but I'm doing a lot of COVID stuff. So if you keep your eye on Baltimore magazine <clears throat> in June, um, that's a hint, uh, keep an eye on that. And then um, another series I'm hoping to start with COVID pretty soon. Uh, and then I'll, be working on something with Devin, hopefully for the ne in the next year uh, with photography. But um, yeah, if you follow me on Instagram, I tell my mother, she's like, I haven't heard from you. I'm like, just look on Instagram. I'm right there. It's fine. Um, I get the guilt. So yeah, so just, you can find me on Instagram. Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn to, uh, there's a few questions in the chat. Um, let's see. This is an interesting one um, from a fellow journalist from ER Ship is on the line. And she says to each of you, uh, do you approach your work as somewhat detached chronicler or are you telling a more personal story that grows out of a quest for justice? Do either of you want to tackle that? Well, I, I, I tell my students that you need to be a human first and a photographer second. <laughs> and it's okay to intervene. You, you know, I've seen a lot of professionals that stand back and say, we're only here to document the news and that, you know what? Okay. That works for them. But you know, if I see an injustice or I see someone, my, my reaction is not going to be just to take pictures and leave it. My, my reaction is going to be help them and try to get it, you know, try to get a picture out of it. I think that local photojournalism, as far as the quest thing goes, I think that local photojournalism Especially, you know, if I have no business like being in Syria, right, and taking pictures over there, a lot of a lot of, and it's mostly white, you know, male journalists whine and complain how their work doesn't matter. And like, well, it, it would matter maybe if you stayed in your hometown and help the homeless, or you know, focus on a community there instead of trying to get these accolades and these prizes by flying over to Iraq or wherever and getting the great yeah. shot. So for me, I mean, it, it, it's working in the city, you know, um, and I try to keep, I, most of my assignments are here. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't have an agenda when I go in, you know, I also tell my students don't take sides, take photographs. Um, Cause I have to, you know, I was on the Trump trail for city paper. And I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, 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 if that didn't, you know, I mean, I, I had to, I had to, I had to chill. I had to keep it, low and just take pictures 
and I couldn't let my feelings get in the way of the pictures. But I also think you need to be a human being and you, you need, you know, you need to be a human first. Kevin, do you have a, a yeah. different answer? Uh -huh. Or, or um, no, um, pre pre yeah, pretty similar. Um, um, I'm still like a baby in a photography. I'm still considered, uh, like I guess the time cover I was an amateur, so I'm kind of creating as a photographer. And you know, when I was documenting Freddie Gray, that was something that. I felt connected to it. that one of my friends was murdered by you know police um, in Baltimore City. I've been subjected to police brutality. I've had uh, been wrongfully accused and had police put drugs on me just to lock me up. I've been subjected to it all my life, so I felt very connected to it. You know, so for me, when I first started, when I was documenting things, these things were personal. You know, and I wanted to make sure that the narrative was being told from our perspective also. But as I started to be being able to travel, because I've been in Baltimore all my life, but when I started to travel outside of my community, and that's when I hit that fork in the road and I really started to understand who I was as a photographer. And it's something that I live by that I tell myself, sometimes being the best photographer is not always about the pictures you take, but the pictures that you don't take. Mm. And I found it, and I stuck with this when I went to Salzburg, Austria, and I went with Fred Lazarus from Micah, I went with Dina Hank from the Contemporary at the time. We went to go study, and I snuck into a Syrian refugee camp with some other photographers from Africa and the Netherlands. And when I got into this refugee camp and I saw these families, because I wanted to know what was going on, because I was eager, I was taking pictures, but then the pictures, they were clear, they were sharp, but I could not tell their story. And that's when I realized that I'm not meant to tell every single story. So mm -hmm. moving forward from that, I, like Joe said, I had to be a human first. So when I go and I go tell a story that I might not be attached to, I try to bring a human component and then, you know, always have respect, you know. So for me, a lot of my work is things that a lot of my, I wouldn't call myself a journalist or a documentary photographer, but I am. But I like to take pictures and create art that starts, a, you know, a conversation. So a lot of times it is from my own personal, you know, view because I'm from Baltimore. But, you know, I do push myself to document other stories and things that I might not be attached to, but understanding that I am just being a conduit to these stories and not actually being the one speaking. You're not hearing it from the host's mouth. Just, I'm just a conduit for that story. So that's an interesting segue to what is going to be our last question, because um, it's been asked a couple times now um, from Facebook and from, um, from others. And that's about the reality of right now. Now, Joe, you mentioned sort of kind of, uh, that you're working on something right now around COVID, but there have been a couple of people are asking about what kind of, um, what kind of documentation you all are doing to kind of make a record of right now and the COVID pandemic, the quarantine, and the fact that it has um, particular challenges for the African-American community, both in the morbidity and also in sort of the demands of the stay at home. Um, well, I'm, I mean, my, my, my COVID coverage is in, is in, three, it's in three parts. Uh, the first part was the initial lockdown where we were, where people were kind of forced to stay behind glass. That's kind of ending. Um, the second part, which is still ongoing, is portraits of essential workers. Uh, the ones that won't be on the cover of Time Magazine and the New York Times, like midwives and trash truck drivers and people that are running, the, basically running everything and not getting any credit for it whatsoever. You know, A-Rabbers who are taking food to the communities in Park Heights, I mean, they're getting a little more coverage now, um, thanks to Holden and what he's doing with Food Rescue. But, uh, and then, is that um, you? you yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and then the, uh, and then the, third, the third series I'm about to start is portraits of, um, of families who have lost people to COVID. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do a series of uh, these portraits, uh, very respectful black and white portraits of the effect that the virus has had on on families that have you know kind of lost people. So that's going to be my 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 three part there. I am working. I can't really talk about it, but I am working with um, a magazine, a local magazine, and a writer on uh, some other kind of old my back to my old school city stuff, and that's coming up. 
um, which I'll, I'll announce that on my on my Instagram when it, when it's appropriate. So I I am still doing that, and I also teach part time at Baltimore School for the Arts. I'm their black and white photography teacher. And Devin, are you out shooting now? No. <laughs> um, no. Um, no. So I'm I'm out. Uh, my thing is like I have a I have a daughter and. I'm around, my, I'm going to stay with my mom, so I can't afford to, like, be out but so much. Yeah. You know, like, um, um, yeah, so uh, I, I have been documenting just looking at, like, because my style, I usually create stuff. I take pictures. I go wherever my heart blows me. I don't, like, you know, Joe's really good at, like, building an assignment and having an idea. I just start taking pictures, and then I find the idea later, and then it will come <laughs> together, however it sees fit. But um, right now, you know, I plan, like, this year was, like, my year off. So, like, this year was just studying. I've been painting. I've been, for the past two years, I've just been studying the painters and playing with other different mediums. So actually not so much photography, but I've been painting, you know, doing performance art over the last couple of years and just uh, trying to expand my repertoire of art. Um, right now, my biggest project is just, I'm building, I have my own clover line coming out with Under Armour and I'm starting my own fellowship, um, which will be through their eyes um, with the help of Under Armour and Steph Curry where we would take my um, my programming around the youth and then it would be, now it would be, um, we'll have Under Armour behind it. So there would be uh, stipends and stuff involved with the kids that I teach to pay for their equipment and transportation. So I'm really gearing up for uh, 2021. Um, I had a lot of shows this year. So a lot of those have been pushed back. So I'm still out taking pictures, but more so my documentation is like pictures of my daughter or my nephew, or, you know, if I'm walking, you know, to the store or, you know, take, I see masks and gloves on the ground, you know, documenting that stuff. But for the most part, um, I've just been trying to take it's, it being black and being in COVID. A lot of people don't talk about it. But if you look at we look at the news and with everything that's going on with people dying, being killed, or people being harassed by police officers. That's something that I'm trying to just digest right now. So a lot of a lot of a lot of this time is mostly just sitting with myself and then just, you know, taking it in a lot, you know, because being black and being in COVID is something a lot of people don't talk about don't talk about but you know i'll probably tell that story later on okay um i'm just gonna check the time so actually we do have a couple minutes and i have there's a question from um one of our participants that i also had on my list that i didn't get to ask you both which was about the choice to use black and white um, Devin, your work is, uh, that at least what I saw at the Lewis was all in black and white. And Joe, these photos are all in black and white. Um, if you could talk a little bit about sort of why you make that choice, what you gain by using black and white, and if you lose anything by not using color. Well, I, I think that, you know, again, and when I say I tell my students, cause this is a question I get all the time. So I get a lot of these questions. Um, Black and white, I think, is the language of photojournalism. And when I, I say that, what I mean is, is that if you, are, if you really want to concentrate on this subject, on what's going on in the picture, I, for me, I think black and white really communicates that across. When color isn't part of the context of the photo, in other words, if you have a person with a red umbrella walking at sunset past a blue building, that's not going to look very good in black and white because it's a communication in color. So that's when I would choose to use color. But if I'm trying to, um, you know, do a story like say on the um, on the heroin trail or or you know the gray and black and white, it's because I really want people to focus on the subject going on in there and not be distracted by the things around it. Um, I, I just got uh, uh, work at ProPublica. They want straight up black and white, you know, because because of that. So that's why I do it. Devin, why do you make that choice? Yeah, for me, because I struggle with different kind of hues. I kind of got like, uh, I kind of got, um, I'm like slightly colorblind. You know, like I would put on clothes and stuff and go out to the house with a kid. My mother like, what the hell did you got on? You don't match. You know, stuff like that. But, um, hey, sorry, guys. That's my stepfather. Like, I told you I'm staying with my mom. Like, he, <laughs> did, he didn't even look to see what I was doing. He just can't understand it. <laughs> Loud enough. On this Bluetooth, but I chose black and white because, because I, I when I first started photography, I would uh, like when I started doing shoots, I would struggle with certain colors in the editing. So um, I started to lean towards black and white. But I always loved black and white from studying going park so much, and I would shoot film and I would shoot film on a Canon A1, 
and I and I fell in love with it. So I just started shooting it digital, shoot on digital. And um, hold on. <laughs> I I think I'm actually gonna take that as a cue. Um, oh no, I'm gonna finish. I, I just oh, had to oh, shut okay. the door okay. on real quick. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, so what I found is similar to Joe when. I know when I look at an image, the way that I digested the human brain is like, oh, you look at all the colors, you're, you're like dissecting this image. But when I drain that image, you get the raw emotion and what I want to portray to you. So I prefer black and white. Like he says, I feel like it's the raw essence of what's happening in that moment. And I actually shoot black and white. You rarely see color for me. I only start shooting color because people say I couldn't do it. So I do it. But and I do it for clients, but for the most part, I probably will always shoot black and white because a lot of my work is about so much the emotion and not so much of the landscape and the pretty colors. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to thank everybody for joining us this evening. I do have a couple of closing reminders. Um, my colleagues are going to share some links in the chat box. They're going to reshare the link to the exhibit that we've been talking about, which is in there a couple of times, but just one more time. So it's at the bottom. Um, and next, I do want to tell you all that during this unprecedented time, the Jewish Museum of Maryland is proud to work with our colleagues at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum to provide this meaningful online program. And donations to us help us continue to serve you from a safe distance. They are appreciated, but of course not required. Um, all donations will be split evenly between the JMM and the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. And so a colleague is going to share that link in the chat box. And finally, um, we will share a link to a survey about this program. And we would really be grateful if you would be willing to uh, take that survey. It will help us figure out what works and what we should do more of and what we should you know, tweak um, for the future. So thank you all for joining us. And I'm just going to say good night. Thank you, Devin and Joe. It was so great to you. meet you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes, Joe. Yeah, you caught, caught me off guard on the question of the people that came out. So I want to shout out to Thugma. I want to shout out to Jacob Marley, Audrey Gatewood. These are young photographers that are coming up. The homies. Right mm -hmm. after uh, Marie Mansion, right right after the uprising, and you're going to see them on the rise. So follow them, keep an eye on them, and watch out on uh, Instagram for them. So great, thank you, Devin. Any final words? Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, Joe, amazing work as always. Super happy to be a part of this. Um, make sure y'all please continue to uh, support Joe. He's probably one of the the greatest photographers coming out of, well, will be, you know, in Baltimore history. So please support him. And like he said, it's a lot of young creatives coming mm -hmm. out on the scene. So please, you know, support the young creatives in Baltimore. Um, if they go to the institutions or not, you know, um, please support young black art coming out of Baltimore. And it looks thank like you. Jackie wants to share something from the- Yeah, uh, I just want to thank everyone who joined this uh, conversation, this program. Thank the Jewish Museum and everyone again. It was really insightful, um, really important. And I love the way that you all are paying attention to the time in which we're living now. And thank you for all of your support. If you care to donate to the Jewish Museum or the Lewis Museum, we are still trying to do the good work that all of these organizations are doing, even in the time of COVID-19. So thank you, Tracy, for a ver very thoughtful uh, moderation of this program. And it's a pleasure to work with you. Looking forward to the next time. Absolutely. And, 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 a, and a membership to both organizations is cheaper than your old bar tab for one night. <laughs> so think, put it in that perspective. You're not going to bars, so I know you're saving money. So join both. <laughs> it's still cheaper than going out. And, and what's your Venmo, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>